Hello, fellow humans. Today, I'm talking to the marvellous Danielle Andrade, a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto, Canada, all about her work improving the transition of people with the genetic epilepsies from paediatric to adult care. And this is really important. Um, and as she reminds me of when you might start a new job. So, you know, you have to learn about your new team and boss. You have to reintroduce yourself who, despite your CV or resume, you know, they don't really know who you are and what your personal needs for development are. It's tiring and it's sometimes frustrating for both parties, in fact, to have to reintroduce yourself or in this case, often a loved one who has a rare genetic epilepsy. Also, adult neurologists often aren't overly familiar with these types of epilepsies. And so it's crucial for people not to fall between the cracks. So Danielle and her team are improving this transition massively. If you're interested in learning more about Danielle's work, keep watching and or listening and click on the links below to subscribe and receive notifications of my weekly episodes on epilepsy care and research on YouTube and or through your favorite podcast provider. I am Danielle Andrade. I'm a professor of medicine in the University of Toronto in Canada. And my focus is on genetic epilepsies. That's a rather broad spectrum, isn't it? Genetic epilepsies. How did you get into that? I always had this interest in genetic diseases. And I came to Canada and I did a master's in uh, gene therapy for a form of rare genetic epilepsy called Umpitumpo. After that, I did more training in clinical epilepsy and electrophysiology, so reading EEGs and um, intracranial EEGs and all that. So then I became a, a clinician investigator uh, and I always link to the, try to link the, the clinical part of epilepsy with the genetics. And this is before we had the next generation sequencing and, and all the wonderful things we have today. So. When I started that, it was a much more um, rude form of uh, genetic testing that we had available, and the genetics research was also um, at a different level at the time. Is that being quite polite at a different level? It wasn't quite as advanced. <laughs> well, things evolve, right? They are always changing, and, and what we know today, I mean, a week from now, we'll know more things, and if year and so think about 20 years after i started so that's 23 years actually oh wow god that's some experience so that's about well just slightly longer than i've been in uh, after my diagnosis so so um regarding genetic epilepsies well so i read recently that and this was a rather broad uh, statement but that there were at the moment between four to six hundred identified genes um recognized to be involved in the genetic epilepsies. Is that about right or is that completely off? No, that's, that's about right. I mean, it depends on how you count. So there are many genes that they are what we call solely responsible for the disease. And, and so yes, uh, 40 to 600 is a good number because some genes are, are associated with not only epilepsy, but intellectual disability and autism. And so depending on how you look at that, that's why we have this little variance in the numbers. But yeah, and then we have other forms of epilepsy that are caused by multiple genes. And, uh, and in those cases, so those four to 600 genes are, we are not counting the ones involved in the in, in multiple, um, in the more common forms of epilepsy, like temporal lobe epilepsy and juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and things like that. So, if you care, if we count, it, take into account the temporal lobe epilepsies and other types that are more common, perhaps, um, and the genes associated with those, then it goes above the six hundred. Is that right? Yes. Wow. That number's going to go up as well, isn't it? Oh yes, it will. For sure. Yeah. So, so what do you actually do? How much of your time is spent working with patients and families, and how much is spent, um, you know, in research? I would say probably sixty percent of my time is with patients uh, and, and families, and um, and the rest is divided uh, between research and a bit of administration and teaching. We are at a university hospital, so we also do some teaching. 
And um, the work with patients is a very unique work because we see adults with genetic epilepsies, uh, monogenic epilepsy, so those where one gene is responsible for the whole phenotype. And that is an area that is mostly dominated by pediatric neurologists. So, because these are conditions that they start manifesting early in life, oh, either in the newborn or first or second year of life, the patient start having seizures, and then they develop the other symptoms as well. And so, so the pediatric neurologists are very, or they are more familiar, I, I should say, uh, with these conditions and with genetic testing and ordering genetic testing and all that. And the adult neurologist is uh, coming a bit late to this. So most adult neurologists are not very familiar with the genetic epilepsy. So many of the patients that have what we call developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, which are those very severe epilepsies associated with intellectual disability that, that causes very frequently. Uh, they used to be called symptomatic epilepsies, and because we didn't know the genes causing those forms of epilepsies, they were all put under the same umbrella and, and called symptomatic epilepsies and all treated in the same way, which was usually just repeating the medications that the pediatric neurologist was prescribing before they came to the adult system. So what we do here is a very different approach in that we reinvestigate the patients and we look for a diagnosis and we do uh, panels, we do whole, gene, a whole exome sequencing on a clinical basis. And if we can't find the results with those things, we will do whole genome sequencing on a research basis, which we, we like I told you, we do research here as well. So we really want to find the cause of the epilepsy. Um, we have many patients that have a diagnosis of cerebral palsy that when you reevaluate the whole story, you see this is not really cerebral palsy. This is a form of genetic developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. So let's investigate and then find the gene. And sometimes we change the treatment depending on what we find. Uh, we have patients that have a history of vaccination encephalopathy, which is, uh, you probably heard of, like in the past, people would say that the vaccine gave the, the epilepsy. Now we know that these people, uh, they actually had a gene that would, uh, that caused their epilepsy. And probably at the first time they had a, a, a fever or uh, something would be the first time the seizures would start. It coincided with a vaccine because vaccine sometimes cause fever. Um, so, and then they got this label of a vaccine encephalopathy uh, when in fact they have a genetic epilepsy that wasn't properly diagnosed. And there's no one to blame. I mean, this, like, these patients were investigated 18, 20 years ago, and they had the $1 million World Cup when, when they started with their disease. But we didn't have the technology to find the genes at that time. So now we have this technology. So it is, uh, we as, as adult neurologists, we have to reinvestigate these patients. We have to start the work again because the work that was done when they were children um, is obsolete. So we really have to give them a new chance at finding a diagnosis. And it's, it's amazing uh, when you find a diagnosis in an adult, um, the, the parents usually, they... It's a mixture of a relief and, and closure and because unfortunately um, some parents have this feeling of guilt. What did I do wrong? Was it like a glass of wine that I had when I was pregnant? Was it uh, a fight that I had with uh, someone when I was... So like there's all these theories and when in fact we know it's a genetic disease that caused all those problems. So. Um, it is it is uh, a very important to make the diagnosis, even if the patient is adult, and you wonder, okay, so what's the, the benefit of making the diagnosis in the adult? So there's research saying that the parents 
quality of life decreases after they have uh, a diagnosis of a, a, a adult child uh, with a genetic condition. You can do um, genetic counseling for the siblings. Sometimes the siblings, the healthy siblings, are very concerned because they are at age bearing, uh, a child bearing age, and they wonder is my child going to have something like my brother or my sister? So if you have the diagnosis in the patient, you can tell, or many times you can do some tests to see if the siblings are also carriers of, that, of, of those genes or not, and what are the chances of them having a child with the same problem. Uh, in some cases, we can change the treatment and, uh, and with this, we get a better surgery control or less side effects or things like that. And of course, there's all the uh, precision medicine coming up now. And even though when we talk about precision medicine, we think of children, uh, there's no reason why adults could not have precision medicine. I mean, they, it might not revert their phenotype to, to completely normal, but there might be a chance that many things will improve. So, and you cannot do precision medicine if you don't have a precision diagnosis, right? You really need to know what's going on so you can actually deliver the proper treatment. So it's a whole world of different things that we need to do for, for these adult patients. Um, the other thing that we do here is, for instance, um, understanding the natural history of the diseases. So when you have a patient that is 30 years old or 40 years old and you make the diagnosis of at this age of a genetic epilepsy, you can see what this patient went through during his or her whole life. So it's easier to inform the parents of young children that have that same genetic mutation, this is what is likely to happen. Because this is what we see in adults that develop, like older uh, people that have this kind of mutation. And finally, uh, this kind of natural history studies, they will help guiding precision medicine. Because again, when you do a precision medicine treatment, um, you're going to want to understand everything that will change in this patient, not only seizure count. It's a bit different than when we do clinical trials with an anti-seizure medication that you're only counting the seizures and see if the seizures decrease here. We want to see if the, um, the adaptive behavior changes. We want to see if... Uh, the IQ uh, changes or the trajectory of the IQ will eventually change. And uh, if the patient will develop all the other problems that we see, like sleep, uh, GI problems, behavior, sometimes heart conditions, all that, we want to see how that changes with the precision medicine treatment. So uh, this kind of natural history studies that uh, we do here are also very, very important. I love how you speak about these so many things uh, other than seizures because they're often forgotten, I find. Uh, the seizures are understandably many times seen as the priority and, and, and certainly they can be. But like, for instance, you mentioned gastrointestinal issues, that can be overwhelming to a, to a patient, can have a, more, a, a greater negative impact sometimes than the seizures themselves or like, and you know, cognitive function and and all those different things, as I find, generally come second to the seizures. So the fact that you're looking into that is really, really heartwarming. I'm so happy to hear that you're doing that. Yeah, I think it's very important that we look at the whole patient. I, I think we have, uh, we, we used to have a very seizure-centric vision. And, and like you said, it makes sense because we know each time you have a seizure, you're causing some brain damage, right? You are an aggression to the brain. So you want to stop that aggression. Uh, but in addition to that, and as the seizures are still happening, I mean, we have to really understand everything else, uh, what else is going on. And, and uh, sometimes the side effects of medication, sometimes it's just part of the natural history of the disease. 
So we absolutely need to understand there's a lot of um, sleep problems. So patients with uh, epilepsy in general have a lot of sleep problems. Patients with uh, developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, those genetic epilepsies, a lot of sleep problems. And if you talk to parents uh, after seizure, it's usually one of the, the, the top red uh, concerns that they have is, is uh, sleep, uh, speech, cognition. So there's so many things. We have to move away a bit from the, I mean, not not to say that seizures are not a disaster extremely important and we have to do as much as we can to control seizures. But we have to move from the seizure-centric view to the more holistic view of the picture. I mean, speaking from patient perspective, I know that, and although I don't actually have, you know, intellectual disability, but if I am, if I have gastrointestinal issues, if I would have communication issues, which I was actually talking to somebody else about earlier, um, and that is like post ictal after a seizure, when I can't communicate effectively, it's so stressful. And I swear lots of people must feel this when they've got a meaning in their head, but they can't get it out. Um, but all those stresses can make you more likely to have a seizure, right? Hence it's for, even if you are only focusing or, you, or you've got your head focused on the seizures alone, it's so important to recognize that these other factors contribute significantly to the epilepsy. And I do think sometimes for people, especially those with intellectual disabilities, especially severe, it must be hard to read what they are thinking and feeling sometimes. You have to rely a lot on the family and, and if they are with the patient 24 uh, seven, and, and, and the family will tell you very often, this medication, help with seizures, but he's so apathetic or doesn't have energy to do anything anymore. So it's really a finite balance you have to do. So it, it, it is tricky, but uh, communication is the most important thing. We have to have a good channel of communication with the family, with um, group home uh, caregivers, because many of our patients are in group home, so we have to, to be very open to listening what they are saying because uh, we are not with the patients as much as they are of course so uh, we have to listen to them. Do you uh, find recordings of seizures quite valuable? Oh yes definitely. Many times patients have events that they think are seizures or their parents think they are seizures and they might not be. They can be either what we call um, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, but they can be movement disorders, they can be mannerisms. So there's so many tics, so there's so many things. So, and if you don't see that in the office when you're with the patient, hard to tell. You have to bring the patient to do a video EEG and, and all that. So if, if the patient or the family can send you a homemade video uh, of those events, uh, many times you are able to make the proper diagnosis. Sometimes it's still tricky and you still have to bring the patient in to do the video EEG, but many times uh, we can understand exactly what is going on and direct the treatment. I mean, it's not that those things don't need to be treated. Uh, psychogenic and epileptic seizures, they absolutely need treatment, but it's not with more anti-seizure medication, right? If you have mannerisms, mannerisms maybe you can let it go, but uh, if you have a movement disorder, you want to treat those things. Um, but again, not with anti-seizure medication. So you need to know what is going on so you can treat it properly. What studies are you involved in at the moment? What's your research? I mean, I've seen some stuff on, on Twitter, but could you just tell our listeners a bit about what you're involved in or what you're leading rather? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things we are investigating is the um, adult outcome of patients with uh, certain forms of genetic epilepsy. So we're looking at Dravet syndrome, SCN2A epilepsy, SCN8A, STXPP1, CDH19, CDH2, and recently we included SYNGAP1, and I have to say the SYNGAP1 was included because 
the SINGAP research fund was, um, their community was so um, enthusiastic and, and, and helpful and they really approached us and said, so when they heard that we were studying those other epilepsies, they said, why not SINGAP? And I said, would love to, but we don't have all the resources. So they actually are helping us uh, to to do the investigation in adults with SINGAP. So that's like they are fantastic community. Like all of those uh, parent-led groups, they are amazing. Like the, the strength of those parents to go on and, and create these organizations and uh, their willingness to work with us so hopefully together we can get a better future for their children. Like it is amazing. It's amazing. Uh, so one of the projects is that we are working on um, whole genome sequencing of uh, epilepsies that still don't have a diagnosis. So these are patients that have um, their panel, their exome sequencing, chromosome microarray, and nothing was found. So we are doing whole genome sequencing. We recently published a paper a slightly different mechanism instead of having uh, a single point mutation in the gene we have some genes where you have parts of the genes that are repeated several times so the short then it repeats we, um, that's a mechanism that we knew happening some forms of movement disorders uh, Huntington's disease and things like that the cerebellar ataxis uh, and now we found uh, two um, short tendon repeats and two different genes associated with lennox gastaut syndrome. So that's like a very interesting uh, mechanism of disease that you, like the kind of thing you would not find in a panel or an exome. So you really need um, genome sequencing. So in addition to finding these new mechanisms, we are... Um, Showing the, the need to do more genome sequencing, uh, I mean, it's not just us, many, many investigators have already said that genome sequencing is superior to exome sequencing. Of course, the problem is to interpret the data. So right now it's mainly done on a research basis. You don't really get that in a clinical basis, but it, it is very important. And I think all of us uh, believe that in the future we will have exome, uh, sorry, genome sequencing on a clinical basis because it is a, it has a higher yield. Um, and then the other thing, my other head is uh, transition from pediatric to adult. I am the co-chair of the International League Against Epilepsy Transition Task Force. And one of the things we are doing is trying to understand how this transition is done in different parts of the world. So we have, um, we developed uh, a very um, complete, but not too long questionnaire for uh, both healthcare workers and for patients. So two sets of questionnaires, they are translated in multiple languages. And what we want to do is to have um, patients, caregivers, tell us their experience with transition or lack of transition, uh, and hear also from the healthcare providers, their experience, the, uh, the barriers that they see. Because right now, transition is still like a, a young thing in the, in the field of epilepsy or many other chronic diseases, in fact. So we know that children with epilepsy, even if they don't have the more severe forms, if, if, even if they don't have the intellectual disability and all that, um, the children with epilepsy, they usually have a poor social outcome compared with children with uh, juvenile uh, rheumatoid arthritis so, or, or um, juvenile diabetes, for instance. So patients with epilepsy, when you look at them as adults, they have more social isolation compared to those other diseases. They have more um, depression, anxiety. They have more um, unplanned pregnancies outside of a stable relationship. Yes. Lower um, 
income, lower education. So there's a lot of things that sometimes, even if the epilepsy uh, or, or the seizure stopped, this patient still don't reach their maximum. And uh, we think that having a transition clinic might help with that. It might not be the solution, but it might help. I mean, again, the transition should be looking at all aspects of the patient, not only the seizures, uh, but the even for patients that have like a regular, relatively um, uncomplicated epilepsy, uh, if they don't have a proper transition, sometimes they will uh, fall through the cracks and they don't have a, a neurologist on the adult side. And don't forget, these are teenagers. And, and when we are teenagers, our brain's not completely developed and we do a lot of stupid things, right? So what happens is that sometimes they will say, oh, I haven't had a seizure in oh, so long, yeah. so I'm going to stop Such the Such a common story, happens. right? <laughs> right? Or they go to university and there's a, a particular combination of partying and not sleeping too much. I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's like a, the perfect storm for seizures again. So... They really need, uh, these teenagers, young adults, really need a lot of support during this phase where you're leaving the pediatric system where you had your parents, you had someone, uh, like the medical team has a different attitude towards you, right? They, they, they treat you in a different way. When you come to the adult system, you are expected to make your own decisions, uh, most times, uh, the, the healthcare practitioners here in the adult system don't want to talk to the parents anymore. They don't want to talk to the, to the patients themselves. And that's something that you might need some preparation beforehand. So, this transition programs will teach the adolescent how to manage his or her own health. You know, checking when my medication is running low, I need to call the, the, the pharmacy or I need to call the doctor. If I have a side effect, how should I talk to the doctor? Should I call the nurse? What should I do? So all those little things are things that can be taught um, before you move out of the pediatric system. So that's why the transition is so important. And then, of course, there's the transition for those patients with genetic epilepsies or intellectual uh, developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, which is a whole different story. So here, uh, there's there's like a lot of things that you have to prepare. Uh, for instance, you have to decide who is the, who has the power of attorney. Because if you are the parent of a 17-year-old that goes to a pediatric hospital, everybody knows that you can make the decisions for the 17-year-old. But if you're a parent of a 19-year-old that comes to the adult hospital, they might ask you, why are you here? And, and do you have the power of attorney? Do you have, like, why are you taking decisions on behalf of this patient? So you have to have that documentation ready. You have to think about insurance. Well, actually, for both types of, of, of patients. But you have to think about insurance. Um, some uh, children are under their parents' insurance until the age of 18 or 19 or 21. So what are you going to do after that? Are there um, government programs that you can apply to for funding for um, something else? Like special education is another issue for patients with genetic epilepsy that have intellectual disability associated. Um, they what, what happens after high school? So there is a program, at least here, that um, where you can have another three years to go up to 21 uh, in a special education program. But then again, what happens after that? Um, housing. So uh, you have to think about either a group home or, or some form of, um, of living arrangement. And for the patient going to the university that doesn't have intellectual disability and going to university, uh, again, you have to think about that as well. Should this patient live in a dorm, share the, the, the room or the apartment? or Like there's a lot of things. W will this person need some extra time for exams and all that? So there's a lot of things that need to be prepared 
before the person leaves the pediatric system. So when they come to the adult ward, things are a bit smoother. I wish you'd been my neurologist back there. You're know, just having all these flashbacks of stuff that I've gone through and I know that other people, so many people have. And it's so important because you're, you know, one doesn't like to think so, but you know, in your teenage years, you're, and even your early twenties, your hormones are all over the place. Like stability is a strange word. <laughs> like, and, um, and I think people often don't think of SUDEP as well, like especially you know, dangerous at that point, you know, for those without intellectual disability, especially. Um, say you're at uni and you're having a beverage. Yeah, I don't know what that's like. Um, and uh, just so everyone knows, I don't drink now. I haven't drunk for about four years, but I certainly used to. Um, and also like, I know a mum who has a daughter with severe intellectual disability and epilepsy and autism and stuff. And getting the paperwork for power of attorney um i think that's what we still call it here was really awful like it was a, a real process to go through and also she's like a single carer for her child well her child her daughter she's in her 20s um and, and then i know other people for instance who have problems with um their child as they grow up because um they become stronger and they can become aggressive and nobody wants to talk about that they're almost like ashamed of their kid often, it, it seems to me. But that happens a lot and you shouldn't be ashamed, right? Is there support for them? It's, it's a medical problem and you have to treat yeah. it as a medical problem. Yeah. So sometimes uh, medications can affect that. So anti-seizure medications can affect behavior. So we have to be very careful about what we prescribe and we need the feedback of the parents. So no one should be ashamed to talk about this. It is an important issue and it can affect the whole life. I mean, if the, the a child or adult child is aggressive, uh, the, the school or day program uh, may not accept them anymore. And like that will disrupt the whole uh, house life. So. Uh, it is a significant, significant problem and um, we have to treat it as a medical problem, so it must be ashamed. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that. So I want everybody who sees this to share that message. It's a really important message. You should not be ashamed of an illness. It's not a choice. So, um, and there is hope. As it is the case with depression and anxiety, so many patients that don't have intellectual disability but have epilepsy, struggle with depression and anxiety uh, and they might be ashamed to talk about it and they should not because it is like I said a medical problem as well and there is treatment so they should look for treatment. Thank you even more for that because I, I, I experienced depression a lot myself and have done since I was little but it was something that one doesn't talk about and, and it still seems to be the case much of the time it's so silly but yeah, thank you. It is a medical condition. It's not a weakness. No, exactly. And it's not your fault. It's it's something that needs to be addressed yeah. medically. Yeah, it's a biochemical problem, right? Right, and also like like the epilepsies, I think, um, and many different you know medical conditions. One treatment does not fit all. So you you might be you know offered CBT, for instance. Um, for a type of depression and that might not work but that doesn't make you a failure it means you have to keep on trying um, and go back to your clinician right yes yes so for everyone who's listening we're going to put um, Danielle's um, studies um, on the website FX Sparks website so you can find out more information about them there oh thank you for being so uplifting for us all and inspiring for other clinicians and academics honestly this is great um, and I really appreciate your time thank you thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you and to your followers I mean it, it's it's great to be able to, to talk to you and the work you do is so amazing too so thanks for that